back in March, I was in the Amalfi Coast with the hitman. And during a really cool hike in the forest, we we're having an interesting discussion about our body image, our relationship with food, and creating rules in your life to live a healthy and lean lifestyle year round. So we decided to stop and record our first outdoor podcast. So apologies in advance for any background noise. We go deep into these topics, and there are a lot of personal anecdotes that many of you will be able to relate to. So please reach out and share your own stories, as we'd love to hear them. So there seems to be one end of the spectrum where you can either do transformation coaching or you can either do long-term, slow lifestyle coaching. But we're both big believers that one can't exist without the other. You have to have the transformation at the beginning in order to facilitate the lifestyle. And in order to have the lifestyle, you need to have the transformation at the beginning. And each of them will have lived their own lessons and each of them will teach you different things about yourself and teach you different things about your clients if you're a trainer and those lessons will then lead to the opposite you know your your ability to uh, have less food focus have uh, control of your food will often lead to a transformation and will lead to a long sustainable lifestyle Uh, the ability to kind of pull the pin when you want to and need to will Live, allow you to live that lifestyle and then have a transformation or a small transformation like a holiday cleanup or the ability to get in shape for someone's wedding or when you know that you're going to be topped off. Um, all of the skills translate into each other, but they don't exist without each other. Yeah, you need, you need both, which is why we talk so much about it being a phasic journey and how the first two phases all get towards the transformation and then we have the all important consolidation phase which then sets you up and provides the foundation to then elicit the lifestyle solution in the future and a, and a good analogy another analogy is what my one of my clients matt has been saying during his last couple of weeks of a photo shoot is that each one is a checkpoint it's not a finish line it's just something that you you go past you acknowledge it and then you move on to the next one and yeah, it's, it's, it's exactly that. There's no on or off switch. There's no, uh, now you press finish. Yeah. It's, it's continue. Okay, you've completed this level. Now you activate the next level. Now you activate the next phase. Yeah. And that's why it, we call it a journey uh, and use that word specifically. Yeah. And the real reason why we're now translating over into this, into this podcast is now we're, we're sitting in the, the Amalfi Coast, in a little wooded area next to a waterfall and we just thought it'd be a good idea to talk about some more like the sensitive issues uh, that we we see often people are struggling with and I often call this the biggest kept secret in the fitness industry and it's issues with body image now we aren't people who specialize in this specific area but we are people that have dealt with it in the past ourselves and with our clients and just raising awareness to this area and talking about it openly is is hopefully our message to help other people who are struggling with this yeah and like Nathan said just as a disclaimer you know, we aren't psychologists and we aren't trained in this, but we're using our experience uh, both personally and having dealt with hundreds of people and giving our input on what we see to be big issues and how you can potentially solve them or at least work on them to, to make them more manageable. Like for me personally, my, my body image all, all started when when started dieting. Before that, I... It was like the term, the less you know, the better. And the less you get involved in something, the get less you know, uh, the less it will affect you. And, you know, my first experience with having body image issues was when I put a large T-shirt on when I was 14. And it went down to my knees, but it didn't fit me around the belly. And that was my first ever prompt to kind of start dieting. And, and I think everyone has those moments when they realize that they need to either clean the palate or they need to do something about their weight and their uh their feelings towards that you know as you go through the journey of of being on a, in fat loss or being in that particularly you know calorie restricted state things become you know a little more blurred a little more focused towards what's happening you know you are looking at the scale you are correlating that with a with a, an emotion 
you are seeing things happen, whether it is, you know, for a female specifically, you know, during your cycle, you will be bloated and, and more water retained over certain weeks. And that, that can drive people crazy. And that's where some of the, the, the attachments start between the scale weight and, and how you perceive your happiness. Um, when people or, or, or when body image issues are solely dependent on what you've ate and, and, and being, you know, very correlative to your scale weight or very correlative to the way you feel, you know, what, how, how did, what did happen after your bodybuilding prep? Did you feel that you had a good positive body image issue or cause you're not really a person that would say, Oh, you know, you no, know, you mentioned in the other podcast about how you would go on holiday. You would never really clean up for a, for a holiday. Whereas yeah. I could think I'm more like most of the listeners where they were like, fuck, I've got a holiday. Let's go diet for six weeks. So, Initially, I was like that, but what, what I said in that previous podcast was I've now got to the point where I don't need to clean up for a holiday because I've, I've, I feel more secure. I mean, I still struggle with, with it, especially if I'm around people who are in better shape than me. You know, I feel, okay, these guys are in great shape. I need to step my game up. But for the most part, I feel like I've, I've worked on a lot of those issues so that when I'm, when I'm going away, I don't have that pre-anxiety of, of looking how I look on the beach I can I can kind of just just go with it but in the past I have been there where it was all driven by holidays and I wouldn't say it was I think the I think the, the bodybuilding didn't affect the body image as a put that 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 affected more my relationship with food mm-hmm. the body image came from before that which is why I got into training. Like for me, the, the, the reason I got into training was the insecurity of how I looked. You know, I always say the moves in a pot belly was the, 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 the look I kind of sport. And, you know, to be honest, even in the, it, it, now, if I, if I let myself get too fluffy, that comes back. I get the moves in a pot belly back, albeit in a, in a bigger frame. Yeah. Like I'm not 58 kilos <laughs> with a move in a pot belly. I'm 85, 90 kilos with the same physique. So I still have those there, but I just... I think I've just become more secure in myself to, to be able to accept that. But that's not been an overnight thing. That's taken me 10 years of, of training to get there uh, where I feel more secure, not completely secure, but my identity isn't wrapped up in my body anymore. Whereas before, it was very much obsession to the point where identity uh, was very much wrapped up in uh, how lean I was or... Uh, what the scale weight said, uh, you know, if I hit 90 kilos, then while I might have looked like a mess, I felt like I was big. <laughs> <laughs> I could fit in with the crowd now. Uh, so it very much depended in, in the crowds I was in, uh, whether I had my top on or top off, and uh, what phase I was in. I, I almost had the same thing. You know, as a personal trainer, we, we value ourselves and we value, you know, we are our biggest uh, marketing advertisement yeah. and, and and in such a you know in any other industry in any other world it doesn't doesn't come like this you don't ask an accountant how much money they've got in their bank account you don't you know or you don't ask someone that is in finances how they do with their finances it's based on their product their results with their people that they're working with but some way in the fitness industry and, and personal trainers we we think that our our body is our, our own identity uh, it is in the sense where people do believe that personal trainers should be in shape which I, I definitely do agree with but it's not the be all and end all you know results and and their capabilities as a trainer should be also uh on par but they but they don't believe that themselves i think there's three parts to a good trainer you've got firstly they they need to be in shape somewhat and they have at least proven that they can get into extreme shape i, th- I do think getting into amazing shape does add a lot of credibility as to you as a trainer. I mean, I think you said for yourself, no one took you seriously until you got into shape. Yeah. And I know for myself, as soon as I got into extreme, extremely good condition in 2014, that's when my own results with other people skyrocketed. Same, hundred percent. So you get yourself into amazing shape and you learn all the struggles that all your clients go through and, and you can then empathize on a new level to then facilitate greater results. Mm-hmm. That's the first part. So, being able to practice what you preach is an important part, but it's not the be all and end all, like you said. The second part is what you said uh, there in that you need to be able to prove that you can get results with people similar to you. Not, not to yourself, but similar to your client base or similar to whoever 
uh, is the person inquiring. I think that's a critical point of view uh, because if you're someone who only gets yourself in shape, that doesn't really lend any credibility to what you can do to someone else. We see so many people that are genetically blessed, but there's no results to be seen from them. And it's that lack of empathy that, that tends to be the root cause here. Yeah. And then the third part, I think, uh, which, which we place a, an enormous emphasis on is education. And that's being able to educate uh, your client and be able to break down complex terms into simple layman's termino terminology. And I think in some of the podcasts we've done recently, the fact that we're, we're able to use so many analogies just goes to show the level of understanding that we've, we've uh, accumulated in this, in this area of, of body composition and, and transforming regular people with busy lives. Yeah. We like, we, me and I actually have been joking over the last couple of days, like, uh, and we kind of found a new term that we'd like. To, it, it definitely relates to this, and it's you know with the the seven the seven faces of a transformation coach. And we were just speaking about it, and we were laughing and joking whilst having a, a another glass of wine, because <laughs> um, hopefully he would have listened to the other edition by now. Um, and, we, and we were speaking about what constitutes trainers and what do they need to go through and how do they need to be to kind of get the most out of their clients and be very very good at their job, you know and and it, obviously this is often a tangent, but you have to be an enabler, you have to be a strategizer, you have to be a trainer, um, you have to be a liberator, you have to be an empathizer, and you have to, you have to be an executor, and you have to be a problem solver. And, and, and obviously this is another whole chat for another day, but you're showing different faces uh, as a trainer is, is integral to uh, your job. So switching gears now back to just, just to just tap onto oh. that. They are, <laughs> just to tap onto that before you switch gears, the seven faces uh, of a transformation coach, th those seven faces are absolutely critical. And I think each part is, is vitally important, which is why we're looking to put together something which can cater towards these seven faces and teach people how to fill in the gaps that they've got as a coach. And I really do think this is something that is missing in the industry and something that we now have a duty to address. Yeah. Absolute fire. Um, so moving on to like body image and issues with food. And I know in the, in the Amalfi Coast, the other edition where we got drunk, we were speaking about our own issues around food. Now, a lot of people will come into this to this game not knowing that they have a body image issue and i think some quick tips that you can use to kind of assess whether you do have body image issues or you do you you are sliding down that path i think one of the things is what we like to call um it's the the fo food focus so you can rate yourself on a scale of one to ten and this will come um you might see this in an article at some point um, around how to audit yourself for long-term success, uh, which I've been writing. Um, and I think what that, what that has in, in it is effectively uh, a, a auditing system for yourself um, to find out you know, where you're at in terms of these various systems. Um, with the focus, food focus, you, know, you can rate yourself at a one and 10, one to 10. And when that number gets too high, especially not in a dieting phase, there probably needs to be some, some things addressed. You know, at, at some point, food will have to slip down the priority list or like more down the focus list um, and doing things to, to kind of mitigate that, you know, whether it is uh, limiting decision fatigue, you know, writing out your, your meal plan, batch cooking, all of these different types of things that will reduce food focus because if you don't know when your next meal is coming, when you can't, you know, logically put it aside, um, you, you're always going to have it on your mind. And I think, you know, we relate it to something that Akash is doing at the moment, which is using this lovely little toggle um, app. And it, whilst it's tracking time, it also puts a, um, a self-awareness aspect onto his time management. And that's what the, the scales will do, for, uh, the, the, the scales of food focus will do to you. They will add an awareness level. So, and the things like batch cooking and, and all these different types of things will allow you to put it to the side or out of your mind because you know that you're, you're going to audit yourself at a, at a certain point. Yeah, it comes back to differing levels of self-awareness and a lot of the, the body image and food, food control issues that we see 
typically revolve around a lack of self-awareness and a lack of being able to check yourself in the right moments of time. We were talking yesterday over dinner about how uh, one of, you, you ask the client to ask themselves, is this the right thing for my goal right now, just before they eat? Now, what will happen in this situation for a highly self-aware person is they'll say, they'll probably, they'll, they'll be able to check themselves in the moment and say no. But if not, then what will tend to happen is a, is a, is a level of self-sabotage where you start justifying your actions and your brain will start taking over and saying, yeah, I can get away with this or I can have this or I've deserved it or I've had a hard week so I deserve this, this extra boatload of food or, or drink. And we've all been there. We've all had the moments where after a hard week of work, there's nothing more than you know, having a nice meal glass of wine and it, it's, it's so standard and it's become so ingrained in our society where on Friday night it's uh, it's takeaway and a bottle of wine but you have to question why that's happening and if it's something that's happening all the time then there's an issue there whether it's in the precursor that you've you've inbuilt into your body and in your brain or whether there's a a pain point or a or a struggle that's going on inside that you're using food to cover up with I think, and just elaborating on that point as well there is the the ones that we always say oh you know friday night etc you know bottle of wine and a, and a chinese takeaway or something like that but the most common ones that we see are those that will do excessive exercise and then say that they deserve or warrant extra food you know there, there are a few a people like who I've dealt with previously that will go and jump from three week, three days a week cardio to go to seven days a week cardio just because they think that they love it. But what's actually happening in their head is that they're going through this self-justification model where they, they think more, more cardio is better because they get more calories to burn. And then when they do get the chance to let off their lid in terms of self-justification and self-sabotage, they can go for it without there being a, a remark change in scale weight. And that comes down to a couple of things. It's like, how, how often are you tracking scale weight? And the second of all is, you know, are you addressing the real issue at hand? And basically in that point of view, when you're upping cardio to then justify more food, you're, you're covering a bullet hole with a plaster. And unfortunately, they never stick. And if you, if you were injured for a week and you kept the same food eating patterns and then removed all the extra cardio you'd be doing, you would be five kilos up. Yeah, and that's an interesting point because after my bodybuilding program 2014, I used to do the exact same thing where I would increase my activity just so I could gorge on food. And probably the worst situation I had was it was after, I think it was after a team event at the place I used to work at and me and an old colleague went to Pancake House. Pan, um, I hop. No, no, in, in Shoreditch. Um, breakfast Club. Mm. So Breakfast Club, yeah, Breakfast Club. And I must have ordered a, a big stack of pancakes. This is after having... We had dinner, we had dessert, we went, for some, we went for some drinks, and then for some reason I thought, okay, let's go, for, let's go to Breakfast Club. And I was still in that mentality of binging. Mm. So we went to Breakfast Club, we ordered a massive stack of pancakes, and of course all the sides were... You know, the different sauces, the different syrups, and it's just basically sugar in liquid format. Yeah. Pour all of them on it, gorge myself, and then for the next like couple of hours on the way home, I felt like I had a brick in my stomach. Mm -hmm. Fall asleep around 2, 3 a.m., wake up an hour later, and literally ran to the toilet. Uh, <laughs> I thought I was going to shit myself. <laughs> so, ran to the toilet. I'm sitting on the toilet. You know, I exit that way. <laughs> and then at the same time, I'm like, fuck, I need to throw up. So I had to get up, turn around <laughs> and, and throw up as well. And, and that's when I was like, what the fuck is happening here? Like, this is really bad. Like, I should not be getting to the point where I'm eating so much just to do that. And, and we laugh, but there's a real issue there. And it was a sense of, but when, you, when you're compensating food intake for extra energy output, it's essentially a form of binge and then purge. Mm. The, the, car, the purge is instead of throwing up volu um, voluntarily, yeah. you're, 
It's just burning off. And it's the same thing. And, and that got me, I mean, that was a big, that was a bit of a wake up call there mm -hmm. because then I had to realize that there's something going on here that there's various triggers that are causing me to overindulge. And there's also a food relationship issue that I need to solve. And that's not going to be solved necessarily by just thinking about calories or the way I set my day up. It's going to be solved by dealing with the insecurity issues behind it mm. or dealing with various pain points that might be there causing you causing myself at a time to use food to to fill that void and actually interestingly enough i was the opposite to you i was the type of guy that wouldn't do extra cardio i would just starve myself yeah and, same thing and i and it's the same thing but a lot of people will probably see it a little different because they probably will resonate with one of us yeah yeah, yeah and yeah. you know you know six weeks after you do a shoot or whatever and you you don't consolidate and you're still eating meat and uh, meat and veggies three times a day and then going going at the weekend to then stack up on every single food and 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 go on the way home you've eaten cookies and stuff was kind of my life for at least six months where i would be you, if, if you were to meet me in the street, you'd be like, oh, you're dieting. You know, you got your Tupperware with you. You got your fish and your rice. Uh, you got your fish and your greens. And then it's like, when's the last time you did a shoot? Like six months ago. It's like, you, you, I'm stuck in that cycle. And a lot of people will get stuck in that cycle too. You know, I I, had, I changed the environment, luckily, to, to get out of mine. Um, but I also got that, uh, that self-awareness uh, a lot greater by being in a different environment and I'm reading various different things and resources on this type of area. But, you know, if, if you really are getting to that point of where you are limiting food intake five to six days a week to ensure that you're having a bigger, bigger day where you can kind of let the lid off and you enjoy letting the lid off. Like we were speaking yesterday, weren't we about yeah. how some in our culture nowadays, it's actually like a, a thing of where people will say, what's, what's one of my favorite pastimes? And they, they go overeating or like really going for it when it comes to food or eating lots. And, or, you know, a lot of clients will say, Oh, I'm a foodie. <laughs> and, and then they talk about what <laughs> we speak, we laugh because we were speaking about this yesterday is that a lot of people say that they're foodies and then they'll go and eat hobnob biscuits and say, Oh yeah, I'm a foodie. It's like, no, if you're a foodie, you talk about herbs, spices, different seasonings, different the way things are cooked. If you're speaking about hobnob biscuits, you're just a fatty. <laughs> and, that's, and, that's, and, and, that's, and that's the difference. A lot of people just like the feeling of overindulging and then we'll get attached to that as well, which I definitely did. I was there. I still love it. Like I went around for uh, the Vigella curry on, what was it? Sunday, on Sunday night. night. And obviously this is my first exposure of uh, an Asian household. And his mom was feeding me and I was absolutely loving it. <laughs> absolutely love it. Oh, you want another roti? I'm like, I do want another roti. Yes, please. And, and then, and then I just nearly felt really sick <laughs> because I ate so much. And I knew how, I knew how much she was getting, he was being fed. And I was like, my mom could sense I was getting annoyed. I was like, I think he's full. I think, and she's like, no, 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 let's get, <laughs> I think he, he's fine. Let's get the chocolate out of him. Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 I had to take some bloody dairy milk. Um, <laughs> but that, that's, that's more of a cultural thing. Yeah. And I think it was more just the fact that you were home and yeah. it was the first time. So you gotta, yeah. you gotta be looked after. But there was that, obviously, but that you had that past, past moment where you're like, hold on a second. Yeah. I'm falling into that old trap. I mean, you had no choice. No, no, <laughs> your, no. your, your mouth was like chained open. There was nothing. Yeah. Even if you said no, there was good. That, was, that yeah. rotley was getting stuffed in your mouth, yeah, yeah. whether you like it or not. Yeah. But, um, but, that, but that brought out in me, the old me who were like, who loves letting go of, of, of food and not giving an absolute crap how many calories is going there. And I physically, and I know a lot of people will resonate this, is like they really like going for it with food. And now they've brought an association with that. So then, you know, how do you scale back on that? How do you teach yourself that that's not an okay thing to do? Because, mm. you know, whilst 
you know, you're in your absolute right to do anything you want to do with food within reason, not sticking it in various holes, but you know, you, you, can, you, 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 you can do anything you want with it and you can eat as much as you want of it, but there's obviously consequences around various different things like over consuming and not many people want that whole, that cycle of over consuming, feeling guilty, dieting, and then re- redoing the whole thing over and there again. And, and I think that's, it's an important thing to address is that if you really, 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 really like doing that, you know, that's, I, I don't know if that's an actually okay thing, uh, from a mental perspective. Yeah. I, I've, uh, when I had those, um, when I was in that cycle of binging for about a year, I had a lot of those moments where when meal times have come and I think, Oh yes, I can't wait to go for it. You know, I'm going to eat loads of food i'm gonna i'm gonna you know enjoy myself as much as i can and you know yeah more 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 food Uh, and and just um there was something obviously wrong because that's there's you typically enjoy the food a lot more when you can have it and you're satiated and you're fine but when you go to the point where you're stuffed and you feel like you got a brick in your in your stomach that enjoyment's gone and all it's become is mindless eating yeah and and that's an issue and, and what I found that r- really helped me in 2017 when I, when I competed in bodybuilding again, when I started that prep, I said to myself, there were, th- there were three goals I wanted to achieve. The first one was to beat my previous condition. The second one was to do it whilst living my normal lifestyle and having a social life and not giving that up. So that in itself, the two, that combination is already tough. Like mm-hmm. trying to do a bodybuilding prep and get striated glutes whilst still going out and meeting your friends on a Saturday night, it's, it's, good. it's a tough goal in itself. But the third one, which I was really keeping an eye on, was being able to come out of it properly and being able to consolidate properly. And I probably took it the other way in that I consolidated so damn well that for six weeks straight afterwards, I still had striated glutes. So it was almost like a prolonged dieting phase. But I got my calories up to a, a ridiculous amount. And then, I, and then it got to the point where I was almost consolidating too well in that I was still so lean eight weeks later that I had to put on some body fat. And that putting on body fat was a conscious decision to feel healthy because I was too lean. But it didn't mean I started binging in any way. It just meant I just increased uh, a bit more flexibility in my diet, but it was done in a conscious, conscious form. And ever since then, those tendencies to binge have almost disappeared except for situations where I don't have structure in my day so when I have zero structure or if I'm in environments where I have no control I do find it tough then and I have to make sure I'm keeping myself in check but if I can maintain a sense of structure 80% of the time then those tendencies aren't really aren't really there and I don't have the temptations to do so which is one of the reasons why I still eat a very similar diet year round because I want to remove that decision out of it and I want to keep a sense of structure Mm. and that sense of structure then allows me to work in meals with my friends and family and not have an adverse effect Mm. on my physique because when I have that meal I'll eat to satiation and that's usually around right if your if your goal is maintenance Mm. and that's the real magic is being able to eat to eat to maintenance intuitively And a lot of people will will say that you know, and, and hear that and 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 say, well, you know, I don't want to eat the same things all the time around, or I I, I don't want to kind of keep that consistency. Yeah. You know, I want I want a lot of freedom. You know, people want to be able to choose four different breakfast options or have din- different dinner options and have that intuitiveness. Is is it fair to say that if you were to flip the switch and not be as structured and stable? that you would have to spend more time in that environment getting better, you know, and having more self-awareness where there is no self, like, less control. Yeah, I would have to expend a lot of energy on willpower. I would have to spend so much of my mental capacity in the day staying strict that at some point I'm going to blow the gasket. And that's why we say that maintenance with its, itself is a goal within itself. And that's that's how much effort you know Akash would would put him in his, his self in that situation, where that would be difficult for him. That's a not a pain point, but that is something that he oft, he he struggles with. 
And to put himself in that position means that he'd have to spend a lot of energy mastering that position. And a lot of people will, you know, do the whole transformation, do the whole diet and spend a lot of, lot of time doing that. And in, in the course of doing a transformation, think that because they've done that, the rest of it, the lifestyle, the, cho the choice, the, the variety, that's already pre-made because you've gone through this tough time. But as we said at the beginning, you know, lifestyle and transformation are, 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 are one together, uh, but you need what, uh, both of them to kind of coexist. And, and, and that's, uh, that's a big point, uh, really probably the point of the podcast is that if, if you've got situations that you're struggling with, that if you want to address them, you're going to have to spend a lot of energy doing it and it can't be just without thought. You know what? The analogy that I, I sometimes think of is in business in that if you have a lot of different components of your business and everything is done manually, there's going to be a lot of errors and there's going to be a lot of energy spent on all these little processes that could be simply automated. And if you automate these processes in a highly complex business system, then it gives you a lot more freedom and, and capacity to then work on projects that do matter. But if you're spending all your time manually changing little things all the time, you're not going to have any energy to, to, to grow. And that's exactly like the reason why I automate so many things and why the next, why, why if you want to have a lot of freedom, you need to have a structure. And I think in the world that we now live in, where there's so many decisions to be made on a daily basis and we're bombarded by so much information, our willpower reserve is constantly being tested. It's being constantly tested just by our mobile phones. And, mo and willpower is, is not mutually exclusive to different departments in your life. You don't have food willpower. You don't have work willpower. You don't have friends willpower. It's not... It, it's not exclusive to different areas it's it's one and it's like the stress cup that we always talk about all different types of stress are the same perceive, they're perceived the same by your body and willpower is exactly the same so if you're being bombarded by willpower um, pressures from your phone all day long from email from work from colleagues uh, your bandwidth is going to be so limited on food that i think a lot of the issues can come from there as well which is why I, I just automate that. And I just want to, I'd rather automate my food 80% of the time. And then when I, when, I want to, when I want to add flexibility, I can do so without, without the worry of, yeah. of blowing the gasket. And for that 80%, you, like I know from this week, because I've not, not spent a few days with you like, consistently, is that you genuinely love the food that you eat out of that 80%. Yeah. And, and that makes it a lot easier. And I was saying to you, obviously, I'd never had a consistent breakfast for a long time. I could never get something that I liked. And then, you know, that could have been a, a, an extra level of decision that I've been not making or not been doing. And, you know, with you, you generally love those meals. So when it comes to making your 80%, making your lifestyle solution and, you know, reverse engineering what you want from your, your day to day, you have to genuinely like that 80%. Yeah. And without the 80% being liked, you just, you know, you're not going to be able to maintain it. You know, having, for some people that may be having that, you know, dark chocolate before bed, it may be having eggs and avocado and salmon for breakfast. It may be having, you know, a chicken wrap for lunch or having um, different evening meals, lasagna, mince, curry, whatever you want to kind of have it as, you know, you generally have to like that. So for when, when you're coming out of that phase, you know, probably coming out of the consolidation phase, you know, you need to make your 80% likable. And they still need to be formed on good principles. So this is not saying 80% can be junk just because I like <laughs> it. They need to still be protein emphasized, uh, good quality vegetables and fruits. And there needs to be a good uh, composition of the diet as well. And you made a good point in that I, I, I really looked for, I, I really enjoy these meals, but more than anything, I enjoy how they make me feel. And not from an emotional point of view, but more from just a, a life and productive point of view. I don't, when I eat these foods, when I, I, I feel productive, I feel well and energetic. If I eat, just say cakes for breakfast, like take for example, when we go to our, our breakfast buffet here, there's all these options. 
But what I had yesterday was eggs on toast. And that's exactly the same thing I have when I'm in London. But the options there are cakes and biscuits and all sorts of things there. But I know for myself, my rule is protein and, and some carbs. And that's usually eggs on toast. So I just try and find whatever I can that's very similar to that. Firstly, there's no decision. Secondly, I'm not testing my willpower against all the cakes there because I'm not thinking, well, what am I going to eat now? Like, <laughs> like, if there's no preset rule there for myself, then I'm going to blow all my willpower by the morning. Whereas, because I know that's my non-negotiable rule across the world in every environment, it's easy. And that's why it's easy to stay in shape for us now when we travel. Because if you don't have structure and you don't have those non-negotiables or rules, when you go away, you're gonna go, you're gonna be in a new environment, and you're gonna be tested by every new stimulus, yeah. and that's where you're gonna blow your blow your diet. Yeah, I think the biggest thing, well, we haven't even spoke about this ever, is the element of forming your own rules. Hmm. Ooh. And and if you if you look if we look at what is preset, let, let me just. You know, what people come to us with, the rules, they go, you can't eat carbs after 9, uh, 6 p.m. You can't, like, I have to eat, I have to eat no carbs to, to gain, uh, to lose fat. Um, people have their own preset rules via the environment or something that someone has said to them before. And yet, when they don't stick to those pro, uh, hard and fast rules, even though they're not their own rules, they will get a, like a negative feedback loop or, you know, a negative emotion that goes alongside with that. Like they generally think, I think one third or I, don't, I think it was one third of the whole population in the UK are dieting currently. Wow. Um, I don't know. I, th I think I heard it on a podcast. I don't know what the number was, but it's a huge amount. And, you know, everyone, if you have a hard and fast rule that you continuously break because it's not the right for you, you know, maybe, you know, you need to create your own rules. And I, and, you know, things like that when the scale weight go up, it's a bad thing is a rule that a lot of people will use, but it's not necessarily true. So creating your own rules is something that, well, to be fair, I just thought of it now, is, is something that we no, can- no, we spoke about this yesterday. Yeah, we and we said, creating a rule. yeah and, and, and what I said was, I, I've heard of some people saying, I won't eat gluten. And my rule is, I don't eat gluten. It's not, I can't, or I, I might not, it's I don't eat it. There's no choice, there's no, I might, or it's just a rule that they have for themselves. Now, there's nothing wrong with eating gluten, but this person who told me this just says, I don't eat it. So by making that one decision, he's now eliminated a thousand other decisions. And that's, that eliminates a ton of decision fatigue. And we were walking past a, a bakery, which there seems to be one like every three doors. They're here. everywhere. <laughs> every three doors. <laughs> And if I have a rule, I don't eat gluten, there's nothing I can eat in that bakery. And it eliminates a ton of food. And there's nothing magical when people drop gluten out of the diet. It's usually because they just drop a ton of calories. And by having that rule that, okay, I don't eat gluten, that could be the one rule that you need to live a lifestyle that you want and to have the body composition you want and to, not, and to feel great. But for some other people, that might be a terrible idea. Like for me, I wouldn't want to do this because I love having sourdough toast in the morning with my eggs. So for me, that's just not a, that, that's not a possibility. But having your own rules is a very important part of making a lifestyle solution. And I think the one rule that almost everyone can take, take home and implement right away is making sure that there's a protein source in each meal. I think that one rule can... I know that's one of my rules. I try and make sure a protein source is in each meal because by default, when you make sure that there's a protein source in there, you're going to feel fuller and you're probably going to be eating a, a healthier meal. Yeah, yeah. By default. Yeah. By default. Yeah. It, you look at a menu, we look at the menu today uh, at the, the restaurant that we went to and obviously we're in Italy so there's plenty of pizzas and pastas and if you take out what that hard and fast rule that Akash has mentioned, you take away three pages out of a seven page uh, document because there was one on pizzas, which had no, no meat in it. No. Uh, there's one on pasta, which in Italy, they love their meat, pasta without, without meat. And you have another one, which is basically, you know, starters of, of the bread variation. Yeah. <laughs> and, you, and then you take away the bread as well, right? So that, that kind of limits a lot of things. And by limit, uh, limiting you to half a menu, 
you've 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 limited the decisions. And again, this is not saying that you know we're never gonna have a pizza, yeah. we're never gonna have pasta because we've had that yeah. when we've been here. But it's just creating a rule that okay, I'm gonna eat protein two to three times a day. That's gonna make your diet 90 percent better than most people out there. Practical, not optimal. Yeah, it's it's practical lifestyle living, and it's how you stay in shape when you change environments and you expose yourself to new situations. If you just have that rule, okay, I'm gonna look for protein as my main source of food, it's gonna help you make better conscious choices. And I think for me, I'm gonna take away that as well from, I've been struggling with the, the breakfast whilst I've been traveling. And I haven't had any rule. I didn't know what I was getting for breakfast. And every week, you know, I'd see, some people see me on Instagram and post up like a dog shit breakfast in Italy or Spain, where it's like bread, ham, and uh, coffee. And that's all there was. And then obviously there's like this week where there's loads more choice and there is no hard and fast rule for breakfast. So for me, I think I'm going to, I'm going to implement that and be like, if there's no eggs, there's no yogurt or fruit, then it's no breakfast. And that's yeah. going to be, that's going to be my rule because in reality, no one, bre biscuits for breakfast, like I've done it and I definitely have enjoyed it. It's not, it's not, it doesn't, it doesn't work long term and you can't have them every day. And the, I wouldn't want to set my day up like that, but I have been because I haven't had a rule. Yeah. So, you know, I, I get excited when I see the cereal, the cornflakes, the Cocoa Pops, because I really love a bowl of Cocoa Pops. But, you know, in terms of that 80-20 rule, you know, I'm dipping into my 20 and it's 5 a.m. in the morning. Yeah. And, and, and that's, you know, and then you've got that test every single day for five to seven days if you're away at a, a you know, a hotel or whatever, because if you break the, not break the rule because you didn't have a rule to start with, but if you start a trend with that 20% being a lot or moving into the 40%, you're going to find it hard to break by the end of the week. And then that's when the cakes, that's when the biscuits, that's when breakfast becomes a pancake and then lunch is now off and, and you're now in the, in the realm of uh, fuck it land. Yeah, and then you come back and fat, fat, overweight. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so not, <laughs> fat over your target, sorry, that's what I meant to say, over your target. And... Uh, back in worse shape than you left. Yeah. And, and that's one of the reasons why, is because there's that whole on and off switch. I had someone say to me this morning, uh, I've got a boy's holiday this weekend, so I'm gonna drop all fats and carbs. And this is not someone who's dieting, by the way. He's, a, he's in a maintenance slash lifestyle phase. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, yeah, I'm gonna plan on dropping all fats and carbs for four days in the lead up. And then I know it's probably gonna be about 3,000, 5,000, 3,000, 4,000 a day. And I sat back and said, why are you buffering so hard when you haven't got, when you're not in a hard cut or anything, you're just, you're trying to live a healthier, leaner lifestyle, but you're cutting that much food out so then you can gorge when you're on holiday. And I think that's the worst mindset to have. And it's just another angle of the whole binge and purge, but on a, on a, different, on a different scale. Yeah. Whereas if you have rules and you have habits, then, it's not an issue because yes, okay, you're going to be away with the boys, you're going to have fun, but it doesn't mean you're going to be eating. It doesn't mean you should eat a pack of biscuits in the morning and a bottle of vodka for the afternoon <laughs> for lunch. You know, it's it means you can still make better choices and and come back in in reasonable shape. That, that way that you mentioned about your client is just a well thought out binge. Yeah, and it's a pre planned binge. It's a pre planned binge because yeah. then it gives you the justification, you and have the permission, or the permission, yeah, the permission to say. Well, it doesn't matter. I'm already, I've already factored this in. I can just binge now. It, it's okay. But it's not okay because that's not normal behavior to, to restrict that much so you can binge. And I know this is, not, this is not, by the way, putting a dampener on the buffer because a properly, properly designed buffer isn't done to allow a binge. It's just allowed to, it's just created to allow for some extra calories from hidden calories that you won't otherwise know plus or minus that aspect rather yeah, than a exactly. shotgun to the face yeah it's to it's to allow for the plus and minus rather than say right here we go let's uh yeah. let's go for it free for all and yeah. that's the wrong mentality and that's gonna throw people off and i heard another person say to me yesterday i've got a, a gourmet meal in the evening so i'm not eating at all all day and that comes back to similar to what you said earlier in that it's either doing it through energy expenditure or starving yourself during the day to enable that meal. Yeah. Whereas if it's a lifestyle, you shouldn't need to 
expect yourself to binge. You should just be in the right frame of mind when you attend that gourmet meal and just eat till you're satisfied. And I'm sure you're probably going to enjoy it a lot more. Yeah. And again, I've been in that situation where I go to these restaurants and think, well, I'm in this restaurant, so I need to I need to flip and cane it. Yes. Yeah. Maximize your I need return. To maximize the return on my money, <laughs> my time, my <laughs> <Yeah>. investment. <laughs> but it doesn't mean you, you, all you then end up thinking about is let's make sure I finish this food and get as much as I can. Yeah. Not let me enjoy these. Let me actually enjoy this food mm. and enjoy it for what it's worth and to appreciate it and appreciate the company I'm with. <laughs> the funny thing is I guarantee that time when you did that and times I've done it as well, there's a time where you are the worst in, in the group at communicating and not being the social part. Yeah. Like you're, you're the guy who's focused on the food and everyone else is chatting around you and you're absolutely sh- smashing the food. Yeah. Whereas if you say, okay, I'm going to try and chat to people as much as I can, yeah. you're in a great position. I mean, I was at, um, I was at a mastermind event last, last month and I was invited to the dinner afterwards. And... You know, we were all chatting and asking each other questions on various topics. And everyone, about to, after 20 minutes or so, everyone had finished their meal. I was still, I had still about half a plate to go. <laughs> and I said, sorry guys, I just, I just take long to eat. And the reason why was because at, a, at that meal, I was spending so much time talking and, and listening, listening as well. Like listening is, uh, is an art in itself in that you can't, it's hard to eat, focus on your food and to listen a lot. You have to, you have to take time and listen. And I was spending so much time listening that I almost forgot sometimes that my food was there and I had to, I ended up taking like 45 minutes to eat my food. But the person next to me, he finished his food, I think within about five minutes. I barely, I barely touched it. He finished a plate within five minutes and it was a buffet so you can keep going back. He finished three plates worth of food in 20 minutes. And I, and I, I said to him uh, in the evening, I said, do you mind if I, and, and he's a good friend of mine, so I, I can do this. Right? I'm not going to start yeah. giving this advice to anyone, <laughs> but he's a good friend of mine. So I gave him the advice and I said to him, do you mind if I give you some feedback? Um, because I've also, I also help him um, with it. I also coach him as well. And I said, do you mind if I give you some feedback? And he said, yeah, sure. And I said, you know, I watched you over dinner and I noticed that you, you did three plates of food before I'd even finished. I'd gone halfway through mine. And when I watched you eat, you were so engrossed in the food you forgot everything around you and you were just wolfing it down. So I set him a task. I said to him, next time you're all, at these events, all you're going to be doing is one plate of food and you're going to take 20 minutes to eat it. And that alone will create a sense of mindfulness around your food and take the focus away from the plate and into the company around you. Because you don't want to be in a position where you're going to social events and you're meeting up with friends just so you could eat the food. Yeah. And people use the food and the alcohol and, and sometimes even the drugs as a, and they use the people as a gateway to that. Yeah. And they say, oh, let's go out and meet for some food. You know, let's go smash some food. You, know, you hear that all the yeah, time, yeah. let's go smash some food. And these people are using the food as a focus when it should instead be uh, about the company that you're with. A funny, a funny excerpt is that you could never binge or you could never like really like woof a meal down slowly. And no one has ever had a binge on food on like a buffet and ate it slowly. It's physically not, not really impossible. It's possible. And this is, this is all about um, what we like to call like meal hygiene. And meal hygiene is effectively, you know, how you operate in, in, at a restaurant or how you operate at that dinner table that will contribute to your digestion, your fullness, your ability to be mindful and just everything towards that, that meal itself. Um, you know, I, before maybe a year and year and a half ago, I didn't, I didn't even chew my food. <laughs> You know, I, I didn't even consider how many chews I was eating and, and neither do I, uh, do I consciously, you know, check how many chews I'm eating now, but I definitely take more time. And a big game changer was when I set myself a task of chewing that food, but I also was doing it with food that I considered the trigger food. And I don't know if you can ever eat a chocolate bar as slowly as I ate a twirl and and how I actually felt from that because it dawned on me at that moment in time that this food wasn't exactly a trigger 
It was how I was eating mm. it that was the issue. And, you know, if you eat any food fast, we know that A, it's going to take you a while for, for your hunger signaling to pick it up. We know that from a physiological perspective, you're probably not going to manage insulin as well in those meals and you're not going to digest them as well. So therefore, you know, from a, a physiological perspective, a physiology perspective, it's not great for you to do that. And then from a psychological perspective, it's you're probably more the exciting yourself as opposed to um, the actual food that around you, you know, try and try and chew between 20 and 30 times. And if you don't like numbers, just chew more and be the last person at the table to take a mouthful and put your knife and fork down there between every single breath. Like I didn't do this. And then I used, I had obviously classic Nathan talked about his ex-girlfriend again, but um, I had a girlfriend who basically called me out one time at a dinner table. She was like, put your knife and fork down. I was like, what do you mean? She's like, it's polite to put your knife and fork down after every chew. Do you not want to savor the meal that's in your mouth? I was like, oh, probably a good point. And then she explained to me what I was doing. She was like, you look like Gollum at a table over a plate. Yeah. And, and that was me in my, my eating habitat. That was me clenched over a table, protecting my food from the people coming by. And I was woofing it down without even making conversation around me. And, and if you probably check yourself and you're in that, frame of mind you're probably very very similar so meal hygiene is you know one of the things that we teach during the lifestyle solution phase and, and during that like investment phase because you're effectively investing in yourself and that oh there's a cow oh wow oh wow um so we're sitting in the in the in the hills of the amalfi and we're quite lost and we've just seen a cow approach right. us. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to take uh, play this for my ear. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it yeah. should be fine. Um, but yeah, what you said there, you know, the, the old saying of it takes 20 minutes for your brain to register your food. Have you heard that yeah, before? Yeah. And I really do think that is true. And I always make sure I try and spend at least 20 minutes on my food. And it was the same advice I gave to, to my friend that day. I said to him, take 20 minutes and, and make sure you take 30 mouthfuls, it's, uh, 30 chews. And for people who are not trained in, in mindful eating, it's worth doing the counting to make, to make yourself aware of what's happening. Because you'll slow yourself down naturally. You'll start putting your fork and knife down in between meals. Yeah. And you know, you hear of people, uh, and, and you said yourself, you don't chew your food. And, and, and chewing your food is, is, is a big one, but you know, people wolf their food down yeah. like really well, fast. Yeah. And it's almost like a badge of honor how fast I can eat food. Yeah. And I was once told, like, I think you've got an eating issue because you eat so slowly and you savor the moment too much. And I was like, and, I, and I, once I thought, oh, maybe, maybe he's right. But then I thought, now I think, well, I don't think, I think he had an issue. Yeah, because, everyone else has an issue. Because <laughs> he was eating his food in like five minutes and then was burping and-, and He's the one with the digestive issues. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> burping and, and, and blow it afterwards. And, and, and now I know his digestive system is messed up. And it's probably because of that. Whereas I think for people who have digestive issues, sometimes a simple solution is just to chew your food better and, and, dig and let your food digest rather than just giving your stomach a big chunk of food that, that, that's impossible to break down. Yeah. And all of this is encompassing one principle and that is to be more mindful. Yeah. But you can't also do that whilst watching Netflix. And you can't do that whilst watching TV and you can't do that whilst being engrossed in your phone. And that's a conscious effort on people's behalf. If you want to get better at, I don't even know where that cow came from, sorry. But like, it like uh, so anyway. The funny thing about the cow. Is what we went is to the end. There's a dead end there where the cows come from. So it must have either climbed out of the water and jumped up. Or it's come down the, or it's come down the hill. Yeah. We're, we're anyway. at the end of a quite a steep hill here. <laughs> yeah. uh, anyway, so... Um, <laughs> I think it's a ram. I don't yeah, think it's, it's, it's a, a ram. Yeah, it's got horns. Oh, oh, sh <laughs> he's actually looking at us now. That ram looks pretty damn. Uh, yeah, it's big. Fierce. Yeah, he's chewing his food though. That's good. He's getting his thirty chews in. Um, anyway, before we get killed, that you can't be mindful whilst doing these things. And it's if you want to get better at it, not worse, then become more mindful at the moment in time. Like. Autopilot is Netflix. Autopilot is WhatsApp. Autopilot is Instagram. If you want to change these things and you want to get better control of your food hygiene, 
Um, no, sorry, meal hygiene. Um, and you want to get better having more control over your day, then take it away and go strip it back to the basic, you know, cleanse your palate of your meal hygiene and, and go back to focusing on that one thing. Over time, you'll be able to get, you know, better and, and be able to run on autopilot for those, those chews. You'll be able to run on autopilot for yeah. putting your knife and fork down. And you'll probably be able to watch Netflix and do all that type of stuff. But at the moment in time is if you're struggling with either like, these issues of being, you know, not in control of the way you eat, whether it's binging it's, it, issues around that, or it's just a case of that you don't save at the moment or you're not feeling uh, satiated by your food. Um, chew it more and spend more time doing it. Um, and you'll find a lot of things. A lot of people will will go out for a meal on a Friday night or, or a, a cheeky Nando's and they're so excited by eating it is that they're still hungry afterwards yeah, and, they, they, and they don't save it. it before they've been there. Yeah, it's, they've it's, eaten it in their head. Yeah, yeah oh my God, this is going to taste so good. And then they eat it and it wasn't actually that good. It's like, did you actually chew the food? And like, oh, I was the first one to finish. And it's like, well, do you know why it didn't taste good? It's because you didn't taste it. So I had that exact same moment when I was in one of the most amazing steakhouses. I was so excited to go. I was in one of my binging phases. I was so excited to go. You know, I could taste the steak already before I'm there. And then I... I was, with a, I was with one other friend and I devoured the steak. And this is me eating a steak quickly, which rarely happens. This was back in the day though. And I, and I ate this steak. And then afterwards, I was, on the way home, I was thinking, how did that, taste, how did that steak taste? <laughs> like I'd just forgotten about it. I, I wasn't in the moment. I was thinking, I had almost had the steak before I got there. And it sounds crazy to even say that, but I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this where they built up so much excitement around the food, they forget what it even tastes like. And they're so out of the moment they just there is somewhere else and there's something there's something to be said definitely for for being conscious of your food when you're eating it and this comes back to another technique which you might want to talk about now is is journaling about food or journaling about your relationship with food and creating more self-awareness in that situation yeah i think for some clients oh the, it's gone now um the, the thing that, that I've been tr trialing for a while and having known my issues, I think, you know, it's always good to kind of go back to it. And this is, I think for me, this is stripping it back to the proper basics, like not, not your meal hygiene. Yeah, that's important. But like just actually acknowledging to yourself that the, the things that are going on in either your mouth or your brain as you go through this, this thing, you know, I have a client at the moment who won't mind me talking about his issues with gelato and they're very, they're very, you know, prevalent, you know, he's created some, let's say some patterns and some, some, some cueing and some triggers around a gelato, but it can't be removed from the house based on it being like a, a family business. Now he's going to get triggered a lot more than lots of people and he's going to have a lot more cueing and this is going to be, it'll be very difficult for him to kind of cope with this. He's going to have to effectively go through the moment as opposed to, you know, using things like, you know, binning it and staying away because you can't get away from that if he's in your, if it's in your house. So what we've asked him to do now is, is to kind of talk about uh, and, and, and journal at the same time as eating the gelato whilst, whilst that may be a form of slowing down, which it definitely is because, uh, trying to eat frozen frozen gelato whilst journaling is, is probably a really hard task is that he's just basically reconfirming to himself about the feelings that he's feeling and kind of registering it on a, on a simpler level about you know why why he's doing this why he's having this food what does it really taste like and you know how how full he's feeling and in a way just like putting some positive affirmation upon this thing that he's struggling with and i think you know if you're if you are struggling and you are dealing with things around that are, are so wrapped up in your head that you need to get it out through a, through a medium. And, and, and a lot of people go through issues, whether it's home, whether it's binge, whether it's, you know, relationship issues. And, and the first question that I ask people is, are you talking to someone about it openly out of your mouth rather than communicating via WhatsApp, email or, or anything like that? Because, you know, most of the thing that when you look at in terms of research on helping these mental health stuff and, and helping around these, th these issues are, are you talking to people and are you voicing your opinion? And whilst journaling sounds hairy fairy and we always talk about it and, and people must be getting sick of it now is the fact is that it works and it's one of the most like research based, uh, techniques for, 
for helping those type of issues. So, you know, if you haven't done it, do it, give it a go, start small. Like me and Akash completely journal different. You know, he spoke, he, he, we spoke the other night about how he does his and I do mine completely different, different times of the day, but it serves us for our, our purpose of using it. And it's such a, it's such a good technique. And I wish there was, there was a cooler way we could spin it. And I wish there was a cooler name where we could kind of attach to it. But effectively, you know, it is just writing your thoughts down on a piece of paper. It's the whole dear diary moment. Yeah. It's like dear <laughs> diary and do some yoga. But cool. it's so it's so true. And it's one of the best techniques to heighten your level of self-awareness. And, it, and a lot of this does come down to that. Because if you can create a heightened level of self-awareness, you can then deal with issues at hand. Yeah. And you can problem solve for yourself. Yeah. Whereas if you don't have a level of self-awareness, you don't know what your triggers are. You don't know why certain things in your life pan, are, are, are playing out there as they are. Then you're going to be feeling it, and you're going to be you're going to probably be suffering. Yeah. So this isn't to say that journaling is the the magic tool to to everything, but it's it's certainly a way of helping, and it's helped us and it's helped a number of people that we both know uh, increase their level of self-awareness and and work through some some real issues. Yeah. Cool. I think we're done here. Um, before we ex- before this uh, stampede of cows come down the hill out of nowhere, we're going to wrap it up here. If you enjoyed today's episode uh, with Nathan and I uh, of the RNT Fitness Radio, please share it with your family and friends. We've touched on some deep topics here. So if you know anyone who's struggling with anything that we've spoken about today, uh, please tell them to reach out to a friend, a family member, uh, maybe even share this podcast so they can uh, use some of the tips and hopefully uh, it goes a long way and helps them um, helps them pass this. Uh, as always, any feedback is welcomed. You can follow us on social media at RNT underscore fitness or our website, which contains a host of different educational materials now at www.rntfitness.com. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.